group. Hi everyone, welcome to the value working group. Um, Bernard's not able to make it today. So let's press ahead with our agenda. Tony, is there something that's at the top of your mind as the person um, here? No, I'm still really trying to like, <clears throat> I, I work at a startup. So like my attention is very um, fragmented, um, but um, I have been taking all the resources that you guys shared with me last time and really trying to find a, a, how best to uh, integrate them into my day-to-day. -day. But one of the action items that I had uh, taken last time was to go review um, issue 108 in the value um, uh, GitHub repo. Yeah. And, you know, I really like this BRR and OSS PAL model. Um, one thing that I added in my comments is I think from a business perspective, value means something really different to a company like ours, where we are very focused on using open source as the core part of our, um, basically our product. And so in, in this model, one of the metrics that I think is really important to us is where should we contribute our open source developer resources? Um, so like this model in general is intended to surface, like is something overall suitable for use as a product, right? Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I think is valuable to us is as we look at open source components, we know that everything we do is gonna be open source and we're trying to figure out where should we add value, right? So if we look at a particular project and go, well, the code's fine, but the documentation sucks, our best value is having an engineer focus on helping to improve the community documentation. That's that's one of the things out of these metrics that I'd like to be able to surface is where do these projects really need TLC? This sounds to me like it would be a metrics model where you're looking at a few different metrics that kind of come together to compare um, mm -hmm. you know, activity or um, lines of code or code quality with um, different other assets of the or aspects of the uh, project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we like we have open source code that we're using right now where in one project, the code, the core code is fine and we're improving documentation and another one, the core code is fine, but we're helping their testing infrastructure. Um, some of it, all of that is fine and it's the core project that needs help. So being able to surface that in a way where I can present it to executives of like, this is where our effort is going is helpful. So in your mind, you would want to look at, like you would have a list of the different, um, the different pieces of the open source puzzle. So mm -hmm. there would be maybe community and documentation and testing and um, maybe licensing or, or other things. Um, do you, do we want as a group to kind of make a list of those things? Um, and we could we certainly it. can like in the BRR I read through all like because this is a particular interest to me I read through all of the referenced documentation and the one of the things that keeps coming up is that a lot of these metrics are very subjective so code quality yeah, even is something subjective documentation quality is something subjective and um I don't know how to make that more um, more measurable in a, in a way where we can go like, I, honestly, I mean, this is something I'm just bringing to the group is something that's of interest to me, but I don't actually have an answer for it. So I think, um, and Sean, you can speak to this too, but um, traditionally the philosophy of chaos has been, we're just going to help people figure out how to measure stuff. Sure. And we're not going to make any judgments on if that's good or bad, if your answer, you know, if your trends are good or trends are bad or whatever, because yep. each open source project is so very different. Now, that being said, there is a really growing number of folks who are interested in kind of benchmarking and seeing where where they fall in comparison to projects that are similar to theirs. Um, and so in the metrics models working group, that's something that they're going to be working on is compiling um, data sets from open source projects on some of their um, some of their data. And that's, uh, you know, obviously publicly available. Um, and just to just to have a bigger pool of data from which mm -hmm. 
people can compare. And I think that that's kind of what you're saying, maybe not an apples to apples, but something that you could say, oh, this project compared to the rest of open source has, you yep. know, 50% less documentation just in general. So maybe that's something to at least dig deeper on, you yeah, know, it might not. Even, even yeah. what we see on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, I think everyone would go, if the, if you, all you see in a project is code, but you see no documentation, I think everyone would universally agree that that's probably bad. Right. But then the quality of that documentation varies wildly. And I think that because um, documentation isn't as attractive of a thing to work on, people go, oh, if there's some documentation, then it's fine. Right. Yeah. I don't think a lot yeah. of people go and say, does that documentation actually help people? And documentation is... I mean, there's a lot of different documentation that's needed. We've actually run into some situations on our side where there is documentation, but all that documentation is geared towards end users and none of it is geared towards developers of like how to get engaged and how to get started. Yeah. Yeah. And these are not easy things to measure, you know? Right. Um, you can, you could, we do have a couple of metrics that look at things like documentation accessibility, if, if discoverability and inclusivity, and those are um, in our DEI working group. But mm -hmm. they don't say a whole lot about, um, you know, uh, how much is for the end user versus the developer and things like that. It's more of like, can people find what they're looking for? Um, can people access the documents? Are they, you know, hard to uh, hard to get if you're you know, not familiar with the project, things like that, or not, uh, yeah. they don't accept PRs, like things like that. So um, that is related, I think, to what you're talking about. But yeah, I think, I think we're kind of talking about a couple of levels of metrics models, even. So you would yep. have like a model that measures quality of documentation, and it would have all of those different metrics underneath that umbrella. And then then the second piece would be uh, code quality, which I think is a is another whole metric model, obviously. And so then you would have, you know, all of these different metric models, put them together in one giant metric model to see where that. Where, and that's what kind of what this yeah. OSS PAL um, metric is trying to accomplish. Is it seems um, because the 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 in this thread originally there was a model called BRR um, and which was the business readiness rating. And even the original author of it acknowledged like it didn't do, it wasn't really usable in an open source way. And so that's where they came up with this OSS PAL metric. Um, and, you know, in tr you're absolutely right, Elizabeth. Like I don't, I've been actually even trying to brainstorm like how, how can we get data that's harvestable, right? And like, one of the things I find valuable is when people are talking about it and a couple of um, the communities that I'm involved in, actually not even related to work, they do kind of like crowdsourced quality, like where people vote on, like they mostly do it on code, not on documentation, but people like, like even like kind of similar to like GitHub stars, right? Like if people are liking it and using it, how can we crowdsource the quality of like, are people finding this documentation usable? And the other part that I thought of is, you know, from a licensing perspective, Spidex made license discovery programmatic. And there's a little bit of that starting to happen. I'm seeing even in like other stuff, like codes of conduct and stuff, right? Like there's standardized codes of conduct that a machine could go look at a repo and find out, do you have a code, uh, a code of conduct and what does it look like? For a documentation or other metrics, can this group or another group help to establish standards for how to publish that data so that a machine could discover it? I, <clears throat> so I think, so for example, in DEI, one of the things that we're doing with project badging is creating a DEI.md mm -hmm. file that will follow a structure that looks at four metrics that we've defined in the DEI working group. Yeah, that sounds great. And that's exactly what I envision for for how that file would work is that the first stage of, you know, identifying. So, for example, the code of conduct, GitHub really just looks to see that the file exists and they don't necessarily examine the sections of it, though they may mm -hmm. have not inside GitHub. Similarly, with the DEI.md file, 
we think we can scan for the existence of that file and also pretty easily automate the scanning for structural elements that we define. So we can determine if someone's just thrown a DEI.md file in versus if someone has done that following a, a format that we've laid out. Right. And so I think the inclusion of some of these files does enable a certain amount of automation. But to your earlier point about, you know, subjectivity, I was writing some things down. I, I think some of the metrics that we have are, are looking at objective measurements of things like responsiveness to pull requests or mm -hmm. issues or work that brings in more newcomers. These are things that, that can be quantified and though no statistic is entirely objective, I think it exists on a more objective space on some continuum of objectivity than something like code quality, which is, I think, and documentation quality, which both of those, I think, are more subjective. Absolutely, than, yeah. Than That's why I, I acknowledge that it's it's tough. That said, there there are things that projects do that do not involve that. That, for example, when it comes to code quality, there are measurements that are proxies for code quality. So, we've talked about in other working groups test coverage as mm. a signal of you know how what the code quality is and. The inference from software engineering process is that if you have more test coverage, then you are less likely to release software that has some kind of understandable defect in the future. So there are there are software engineering processes and practices that can be brought into the open source world that I don't think exist here in the larger sense. Okay. If if you um, and I'll, anecdotally, I'll sh I'll share that. You know, when I work with automotive Linux people, for example, or, or people who work in safety critical systems and have a visibility into how Linux kernels are developed. One of the things that is, I don't want to say missing, but softly enforced in, in open source software is software engineering process. And mm -hmm. this, this idea of test coverage or ensuring that a safety critical system or a safety critical piece of open source software has a repeatability or a replicable process. Right. And we know we know from software engineering that these are signals of quality, but there isn't one there isn't one like tight signal, right? Mm -hmm. It's not it's not like responsiveness where I think we can narrow it down to a few discrete metrics that indicate comp, you know, uh, level of responsiveness that you can then contrast across multiple projects to see the relative responsiveness. I think when it comes to code quality, there are these uh, proxy signals that that likely suggest higher code mm -hmm. quality, but I don't. I think it's a far more subjective indicator. Oh, you're absolutely right, and that's why I was even like, I was even thinking when I was brainstorming about crowdsourcing mm -hmm. quality measurements, right? Mm -hmm. Because then that's a metric that you can latch onto. Like, what does the community think of the quality of these things? Mm -hmm. And, you know, like we kind of rat hold a little bit and that's my fault, but, you know, I really like the idea of this kind of business suitability metric. I really mm -hmm. like it and I'd like to be part of making it really robust. So the business readiness one that we were yep, looking at? This 108 that we're looking at, um, because not only from the overall perspective of this thing, but as I mentioned, being able to surface places where things need additional help that's really helpful for us because we're a we're a thinly resourced startup and so when i go talk to engineering leadership and say okay we're going to work on this project but you need to focus on documentation that's the best for the community and that's the best for what we're going to get out of the project that's um that's helpful not just the overall rating yeah and these yeah. images that you you have here Sean <clears throat> these are a little I think right now because those all reference the BRR model that even in, if you read through the thread of responses yeah I didn't want to drag us through it today but, model. yeah and so is the with regards to these uh do you do you think those are is the BRR model where is that valid or is there no a, the BRR model like so one of the people I forget who it was reached out to the original author of the paper that came up with the concept of a BRR and even that author said, we've abandoned it. Like, it's not a th something we do now. Um, it's 
being replaced with this other metrics um, tool methodology called OSS Pal. OSS P O W. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Literally O S S P A L. Oh, oh sorry, P A L. And uh, I could read through the thread, but what yeah. is that? Um, so the PAL is intended to be like a reference to one of the author's colleagues who passed away um, and who was part of this, but um, OSS is an open source software, right? So it's a metrics collection for open source software specifically. Okay. Um, one of the things that's very interesting, even, even in the BRR model, if- Is this the those... modified version here? Yeah, that's all like, no, that's not no, even okay, OSS Pal. OSS Pal is much further down. It's a really great thread. I found it really, really enlightening. Those uh, okay. weightings that that are at the top in that figure, those are intended by design to be per user, per company, per organization, because some organizations may weigh documentation quality more heavily than they do code quality they may weigh test coverage more heavily than they do other things so um yeah how to make this more i think this is this particular issue is going to become a methodology and not necessarily a tool mm -hmm. and that's uh that's consistent with some so that's consistent with a lot of software engineering stuff that we know Right, that process is a part of quality. So OSS Pal is more process centered. Mm -hmm. So what would be the path to implementing something that's a metric for this? Is that, um, I haven't read the paper and it looks like a book. Yeah, so <laughs> I think. So I might not read that Predominantly right now, right now it's going and looking at the stable of metrics that already exist in chaos and mm -hmm. find and, and matching up some of the metrics that align one-to-one. -one. And then for some of these others, like the quality ones, figure out how to make them more um, objective and measurable so that they can be added to the model as well. Just making notes here. Mm -hmm. And so if I was to, sometimes I find that when we give something a name, it helps to frame or bound what it is we're looking at. Um, business readiness is taken. Pal has no meaning because uh, it refers to an individual. What would we call this metrics model? Is there an, like a name that comes to mind that we could use to guide the development? <clears throat> Or should we jump into sketching that out in a in a metrics model? Yeah, I don't have anything that's jumping to mind. Yeah. Hey, Mako, are you following the discussion that we're having? I mean, it's yeah, okay, good. Um, Elizabeth, do you know? Do we have a metrics? Is the metrics template updated in the spreadsheet? And is there? Is the metrics is. and what about the yep. metrics model template? Is that in the spreadsheet or do we need to put that in the spreadsheet? Well, that's a good question. It's in the spreadsheet. I don't know if it's the latest version because that changes so much right now. Um, but the sure regular yeah. metric template is up to date. I changed that. Okay. Um, well, let's. I don't know if nobody disagrees. I think maybe trying to sketch this out might be a good use of our time. So. I was just thinking about this and th even thinking about my own comment here and maybe we can go a different way to get to some of this 
Yeah. So, you know, when our, as I put in my comment, my primary thing is figuring out where are, and I, I use this word not in a diminutive way. I just try and I don't have a better word. Where are open source projects weak? Where do they need help? And so maybe if instead of trying to like us as a metrics organization, trying to look down and like divine that by looking at a repo, um, if there was instead a standard for how projects can declare their known issues or known quality or where they need help, right? Like if there was like a help.md with a standardized mm -hmm. format mm -hmm. so that a project could voluntarily flag, these are the things we want other people to look at, or this is where what we think our internal quality is, right? Like, because usually project owners no, like we're not spending any time on docs, right? Or we're 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 not doing anything on code coverage. If there was a standardized way of looking at that, then from a metrics perspective, we can parse that file and get a feel for the level of quality. Right. Like yeah. if, if we know from their help.md that the doc, the docs are weak because they're declaring that the docs are weak, then that can start to be more on a spectrum of I, I don't know if that makes sense. It does. Sean, I dropped a link to the uh, metrics model template. If, oh, if you didn't thank find you. it I, in the chat. I didn't find it. OK. Yeah. Uh, Shoya and Ruth have been kind of moving some things around as part of that community handbook restructuring. So yeah. that's probably why. All the templates are in community repo. Yeah, I looked for them there. and. Uh, Community resources isn't where I would have looked. And I think that's the most updated one. I think. I mean, if you know, if it's not, I can't worry about it. So I'm just going to create this right now. So I put the, I'll, do, I'll work with consensus here. If there's uh, folks who'd like to not work on this, just let me know. I want to work on it, so. All right, let's do it. All right. So yeah, business, I mean, business readiness, I don't have a better word for it, but I I would, it's, uh, somebody has a studio called working title productions. I forget who it is. <laughs> we'll just call this the working title. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, honestly, I have a podcast that we did something similar with our title of our podcast. That's, it's literally called the untitled Prague podcast, right? Yeah. So it's like, I get yeah. that. So we will, um, but um, yeah, I mean, even as a, a perusing through a thesaurus doesn't really help come up with a better word because I think that readiness is really the. But I mean, if I take the other angle of this, of like what 
surfacing where projects need help. Um, like, Yeah, I don't have a good. Do we want to take the organization perspective or take a so obviously you mentioned earlier that you know all these this this readiness is really evaluated at the organizational level in many cases but i think we're trying to look here for something that is not just confined to one organization's point of view on exactly yeah on business readiness um Do we want to uh, consider the opinions of the project itself? Like, is that a proxy for um, what the, like, do we care what the project thinks? So in other words, if they think, oh, we need help with documentation. So here's a hundred issues that all say help wanted and it's all related to documentation Not because helpful. that's where we think we need the help. Is that something we would want to consider here? I, I absolutely think so. Yeah. And um, how do we valence that? Because on the one hand, I could argue, wow, 100 issues related to documentation, that's pretty bad. On the other hand, you took the time to identify them all. So that suggests that they'll be worked on. Um, like if an open source project's trying to guide their own contributors towards a certain section, because they've identified or they think they need their weak. Yeah, in that area. that's what I was kind of proposing with that like idea of like maybe like a help.md, right? Yes. Right. Where, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where they could have a file where they're identifying that. And the, the only reason to put it in the file is so that it's machine readable. Got you. I misunderstood what we were talking about there. Sorry about that. I thought the help MD was for if someone was looking for help to use the project or like a, like a contributor or a potential no, user. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's probably something that needs to be there too, right? Like, I think that they, I mean, maybe what we're surfacing here is that there's a, a need for projects to be able to signal to people what the needs of the project are and the, the state of the project. And I'm fully aware that like a lot of projects, I mean, Linux is a great example. Don't do any of this in the repo. It's all on the mailing list, right? So yeah. <clears throat> maybe, I mean, that, that's a lot of work, but maybe parsing the mailing list to see themes or, or anything, I, I don't know. That has come up in the past with regard to um other things like sentiment and trust and things like that of you know trying to get the tone of the mailing list and i think sean has that capability in augur right sean mm -hmm. yes because sean has a way to look at communication in the community to identify if there are problems um mm -hmm. with you know, communicating. So we could, I mean, I, I say we, Augur, <laughs> or could any, maybe yeah. potentially, yeah, do right. something with the mailing list that way. Yeah. And it's also true, like you get a sufficiently large project like Linux, and it's very federated in how it's managed. So, like, you have all the maintainers and different subsystems maintainer of one subsystem may think this subsystem is in great shape and a maintainer of a different one would go ours is crap we need a lot of help um being able to poke into different areas of a, even a single project there's not just one metric that represents the entire project for sufficiently large projects
so I guess I'm I'm still kind of confused on this help.md. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, well, it's probably like it was just the first word that came yeah, to mind. No, no. It's maybe a bad name, but no, it's it's not it's not you, it's me. <laughs> the, the real intent uh, was for the to have a way for the project to signal outbound. This is what we know is weak. This is what we need help on. Is it I so I wrote a I tried to capture that or what I interpreted help.md to be in the text here. Am I close? Yeah, you nailed it there. Sean. Okay. Okay. So do do people not put some of that information in contributing.md or is contributing mostly just uh how to contribute? And yeah, like the, in, the in my experience, contributing okay. is just the nuts and bolts of like okay. this is how to get the code, this is how to compile the code, this is what okay. we would expect in a patch. Yeah. That, okay. That's my experience as well. There, okay. It's not to say there aren't projects who may put some of this stuff in there, but I think contributing is a less dynamic document than I would imagine this one to be. Mm -hmm. So if a project okay. put forward, they need help in certain areas, I suspect that once they got that help, the, the help that MD might evolve. Got uh, you. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. And, you know, kind of implicit in all of this is like an expectation from the outside world that all of these projects are kind of following software engineering first principles <laughs> in terms of discipline, which is not always true. I, you know, we're being recorded, but I would say my I've taken a, di a deep dive into this with some colleagues who I have six years of uh, work experience before academia developing pacemaker software. And so I've functioned in a safety critical environment and some of my colleagues have as well. And we've developed a course for software engineering and open source. And the consensus we have is that most projects in open source are not following anything that we could identify as a software engineering process. Right. Um, they're just not. And it's you know, it's the kind of thing where <clears throat> I think I think quality does happen, but it I think there is a lack of process rigor and signaling rigor about what quality is in open source that's distinct from some of the Yeah, I I, I mean I'm not casting you know. any aspersions there. I'm just no. like But it's a I mean, it's a concern as you move down the track here. So I like this help.md. Are there other metrics that we don't have that we think we may need to develop to support this metric model? Because I like I like the idea of this help.md file. I think it really is a strong signal uh, from a I, yeah. I, I think I think it would be a really helpful thing to have a project implement. I mean, I'm thinking it would be really helpful even just for chaos. <laughs> like, yeah. like we need a empty file is we have, you know, documentation around like how you can get involved, but we don't <clears throat> have like, you know, aside from specific issues that are rare, um, you know, we don't really have that anywhere of like where we need the help the most. We don't really right. indicate that anywhere. So great idea, Tony. <laughs> I really yeah, like really it. Really good idea. When it comes to, do we have a, we, do we have a code quality metric, Elizabeth? Like that's um, a category I, of metrics. See, that's that's where I'm kind of getting confused because, or not confused, but I think that this kind of business readiness model is going to be a, a metrics model made of metrics models. Yes. Because I think code quality is a metrics model, and I think documentation quality would be a metrics model. So it's like a a mega a mega metric model in business readiness. Yeah. So I mean, I'm looking at the yeah. evolution spreadsheet here, and we, we actually did say code development process quality. So not treating code develop not treating code quality as a static thing but recognizing that code quality tends to be der derived as a function of process quality um, mm -hmm. in the software engineering literature at least um, which is not a bad reference point for something like quality but i think there's there's also when it when it comes to like actual code quality there are I mean, there are measurables that like uh, test coverage, which has mm -hmm. been discussed, 
before, and I believe that's in the risk working group. Uh, it, kind of out of left field, you know, something else that I thought of with this help.md file is, you know, I spend a lot of time in various open source communities just in my personal life. And it's pretty common that like newbies come in and they're like, I don't know how to get engaged in this project. Like, what is this? What, how can I contribute to this project? And I think a help MD file can help that as well, right? Because, you know, I, I pretty commonly tell people, if you want to get in, get started, go help someone translate something into a different language or go help someone with documentation or whatever, because a lot of people feel intimidated by code. A help MD file could help that as well. By giving a concrete thing, like where people can say, check the help.md file, that'll tell you where you can contribute right away. Yeah, so we do have a test coverage metric that we've nice. developed, um, which I'll throw in there as a link. And this is, so one of the things with test coverage that we've learned by doing it is that this metric is fairly, it was not, it's not difficult to define because the software engineering literature does a pretty good job of defining it. What is difficult about it is that implementation tends to be very language specific. So when you're trying to evaluate test coverage or code quality or anything like that, the tools tend to be very language specific. There are tools for C, Python, C Sharp, whatever your language is. There isn't, uh, as far as I've discovered to date, a generalized tool that will look at things across different, um, there's no tool that will look at test coverage across languages. You know, it's all very highly language specific. Uh, just to note, but we do have test coverage as a proxy. And I think just trying to see if there's any Tony, I have a quick question for you. Yeah. So in your in your uh, original thought about this this metric, you were you originally said that you wanted to know how organizations could add value to open source projects that yep. they care about. It, uh, is it would there ever be a case where um, it was more organizational driven? So, so what I what I mean by that is um, we kind of flip flopped and kind of made it project driven. So you know now we're listening to the project to tell us where where as an organization we should be contributing, but if like if a project, um, I I think I'm I just see trying to think of how to, how to yeah 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 you know if you if your organization cares about um, risk and dependencies but the project is a little more laid back in that area <laughs> like how do we incorporate that desire that, I think that comes from the weighting of the metrics oh, right? okay. So in the OSS PAL model and even in the old BRR model, um, as part of that, there's those weightings, right? So, okay. um, and that's up to, that's definitely an organizational thing where the, like we may care a lot about docs. And so the status of docs in a particular project would be elevated in that way. Okay, so we should maybe incorporate kind of both sides of that coin yeah. into this model. Okay. I think so. That way, if the project doesn't care about test coverage, for lack of a better word, and and we don't either, the weighting will will put it into the noise anyway, and we can focus on the things we do care about. I. Sean, correct me if I'm wrong, but if if I recall, that original business readiness model um, also kind of took a spin of if a project's looking for funding or some kind of monetary like donations or things like that. Is that something that also we want to consider as like a, an open source project that wants to sell their project or you know kind of partner with a company, something like that, where funding is on the line? Like, what would 
what would matter to them in that case? Or, or hmm. is that something completely separate and we want to keep it separate? No, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, so I, I, I think what you're talking about is this idea that a project can solicit funds. Uh -huh. And if I'm like, if I'm an ASPO and I value test coverage, like we were talking about, I might look at projects that are very important to me organizationally, like I depend on or import these other projects significantly. And I want to contribute something to the upstream that is valuable to me that makes these projects, in my view, more robust. And the project is likely to accept things like tests that, that are more fully covering the project than other things, for example. And so I might choose to invest money in a person to do that work as an OSPO because it's important to me and the project is important to me without I think we, I don't know, I don't know if you're saying this, Elizabeth, but my sort of riff on it might be that whatever is in the help.mb is great, but I might to choose to fund something for a project that's important to me that's not even in the help.mb. Like the help.mb is one signal. Yeah, yeah you just... know, that, that brings up a different angle on this that I've run into as well. So, you know, Rapid Silicon, we're a FPGA vendor and we're dealing with a lot of like open source tooling in the EDA world and be, uh, there are reasons for it that we don't need to get into right now but a lot of those projects don't take um they don't take pull requests like they take guidance from the community and one of the ways they take guidance is for companies to sponsor work in a particular area right so for a synthesis tool we may the way that they're going to get like a direction to go work on a particular feature is if a vendor is paying for it and putting their direction in that way. So I think we have a metrics model called organizational influence, mm, something yeah. like that, right, Sean, I believe. Mm -hmm. And um, that kind of might tie into this as well. I mean, I don't want like a part of our struggle with developing these is you know, the scope <laughs> yep. just keeps getting broader as we think of different ways to apply the metrics. So um, I don't know that it could be in this, but I feel like there is some kind of tie there. And I also know that there are companies um, who are interested in sponsoring monetarily um, open source projects, but they want to make sure they're putting their money in good places and, you know, things that are valuable to them and things that are valuable to the community and that they're healthy projects. So I know that like, there's that piece too, like overall project health. Because even if yeah. it's a project you rely on, maybe it's a super toxic project and you don't want to, you don't want to give money to them or, or you want to give money to them in, in a way that, you know, they don't want to accept or something. So I think there is a, some, some kind of um, bridge between money and this model somewhere. Mm -hmm. Just, we got to figure out how narrow I think we want to include it into this, uh, into this right. metric. I'm sorry, I'm typing. <laughs> and, no, you're uh, good. Tell me if I'm doing, if I'm getting things down. I don't know if I'm. Not sure I totally nailed it on this one, but and sorry, one more thing, one more thought about the funding is um, if I'm a small open source project and I think to myself, I want to have money coming in from sponsorships, GitHub sponsorships or donations, whatever, what do I need to do to get there? Like where, where, what do I need to? to provide, what information do I need to provide? Is it in the health.md? Is it in my, you know, project plan? Is it in some kind of health report that I can post? So I think that, I don't know that that's business readiness. That might be like something else completely. Um, maybe funding readiness, <laughs> I don't know. But um, I think that would be really helpful to the smaller open source projects that are also, besides trying to get more contributors, are also trying to get themselves sponsored financially so they can work on their project more.
Um, I'm not sure what to type there. You don't have to type anything, Sean. I'm just rambling on <laughs> random thoughts. I think that's a totally separate metric model now that I say it out loud. That, okay. So what's next? The end of the meeting, because it's oh, it, oh my god. <laughs> it is. Uh, wow, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm glad somebody's noticing that because I'm not taking that uh, at all. All right. Um, good discussion, everyone. I think actually it's kind of cool that we made some progress developing a metric model here. <clears throat> yeah, I really appreciate you guys, uh, picking up the ball and running with it with me yeah. here on this. Um, so in the normal process do you guys follow like now that we've identified we might want to have this help.md file does that become like a different separate sub working group to like identify that or how does that have to happen I, I don't think it has to happen in a particular way but i think i think that it's the kind of general thing that we probably want to bring to the community meeting so okay. that we can talk about it there because if it, it would then become more of a I would say, you know, when we try to do things that are going to influence open source as opposed to sit back and calculate things about open source, we tend to make those initiatives. So, for example, examples include the metrics model working group itself and uh, the DEI badging program, first events, and now the work that we're doing with badging projects. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and that's actually where the DEI.md file comes from. And I think the help.md file is a uh, sort of a quality focused pair to that where we're saying the inclusion of these MD files and this and structuring them is important um, to chaos. And so one thing I'll do, I'll just uh, copy this meeting in the minutes and put the <clears throat> maybe continuing this metric model and also developing uh, a new metric model or a new the help.md file put that at the top okay of the next meeting minutes i was also going to say i think the dei working group would be super interested in that um so they do a lot of work with onboarding newcomers and making mm. you know more making it easier for people to contribute so um they might be super interested in helping kind of flesh out what that would look like and what should be included in that file awesome yeah, yeah. I think I think we should take a first shot at it in the value working group because I think the perspective value has is a little distinct from the DEI perspective. Like it might be hard for that group Agreed. to grok help.md and how's that different from DEI.md. I think I can see mental gymnastics trying to sort out the difference, but I think we know what yeah, we agreed. need. Yeah. So if we uh if we focus on that first, then I think we're going to make more progress more quickly. Okay. I've, I've learned if I can dodge definitional debates inside chaos, we, we work faster. <laughs> so um, I guess the time is up, so I'll stop.